This is a talk that I titled an, an Intersectional Personality, Working, Learning, and Adapting to Life in Tech. My name, of course, Rico Rodriguez Collins. I'm a software engineer at Carbon5. You can find me on the Twitters, although I don't tweet that much, and on the GitHubs, yay, as Rico Kareem. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. However, if you're family, you can call me she, her, and hers. Lessons I've learned. Lesson one, bringing my whole self. I seldom do this. In fact, there's a word for people who brought their whole selves, at least in my opinion, um, and I call them um, weird, AF. Uh, no, not really. Uh, I do tend to bring my best self though. Um, in fact, we all tend to bring our best selves, the self that we're most proud of, the self that is most marketable, the self that is, has the most appeal, and the self that tries to look professional. Um, I even had a motto for a long time, uh, especially being the first in a lot of things. And it was, uh, don't let all of your diversity tags outshine you. There's a tactful limit to how much people can stand hearing about how unique you are. And uh, just share a little bit at a time, depending on the context. And I would try to blend, always try to blend. Um, don't reveal your entire deck of diversity cards and don't pack a bunch of tags like you're packing a PR. You, you, and I, I, and I, I feel that you guys can, 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 can relate with me on this. You know those 10 times engineers that really don't want you to look at their PRs. They don't want rejection. So they just pack a whole bunch of stuff in there. It's like 900 files and everything. You're supposed to review it because you know, have all this time and, and correct them on like syntax and things like that. So they put it in there knowing that you would just look at it and just check it and say, okay, fine, looks good enough. And they're like, don't do that. Break them up into discrete, digestible, testable, mergeable parts. Break up your diversity tags. Anyway, I learned along the way, it was all BS. It's a bias-based system. And um, how are you gonna be able to bring your whole self if people are still gonna judge you on things like your hair, your, hair, your mannerisms, your customs, your lifestyle, you know, it's things that you can't help or things that are just part of you. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> a long time ago, um, I was a performer. And one of my gigs, the one that gave me the, my start actually in, in, um, in entertainment was a place known as the Queen Mary. Um, you know, uh, uh, no, not, not that one, uh, this one. In Studio Freaking City. Uh, the club had been around for over 38 years, and uh, to put it in a nutshell, it was one of the first safe nightclubs where trans women, drag queens, and gender nonconforming people could get, can gather, entertain, and earn a living. It wasn't quite a, a New York City ball, but for us, especially here in the Valley, especially in Southern California, the, the land that goes to, to go to bed at like 11 o'clock, it was a uh, home. Uh, this is some pictures. This is actually, if anyone's old enough to know who Anna Nicole Smith was, she was a regular at the club and a good friend of mine. Um, and this is like the cast at the time. And she came back when she lost all that weight. Uh, and uh, another cast photo. And right shortly before the, the, the show closed, this was one of our last photos we did. Um, the Queen Mary bolstered in my confidence. It was a great um, you know, practice for my creativity um, and it sharpened my showmanship skills just so well. I was so nervous uh, performing in front of people before and the show just, you had to, you had to get rid of that right away. But um, I was told by my acting mentor not to include it on my resume ever. To him, it was just another part of gay culture, something that could hold me back. So, Thinking about the people that I worked with, the heart that they gave, the fact that they accepted me wholeheartedly, the fun that I had, the, the hard work that went in, and some of them were no longer with us and stuff. It's really, it, and the person that gave me this advice, that mentor, was actually himself gay. Uh, but um, I guess he called himself protecting me, but I, there's always that part of me that wonders, like, you know, uh, how do you balance fighting for what you believe in and convincing people and teaching people with getting your foot in the door. After a couple of auditions, I got an amazing talent agent. 
I started to work more outside of the club and mostly with musical theater and commercial print. Um, but what I most wanted to do actually was dance, uh, especially in music videos. Um, most of the on-screen work I did was within the Black entertainment community and, of course, unpaid. Um, and against my agent's wishes, I insisted on doing free stuff because I really wanted to be there. I wanted to be part of the action. I was a sucker for the artists, and I liked being part of their work. Um, the work included even singing some backup as well, uncredited. So I started out doing stuff on Soul Train, got that straight from the club. They saw me dancing. Later on, um, I got a, a couple of spots with Shaggy, like one, actually it may have been two videos with Shaggy. And the big one that I loved was Dancing with Aaliyah, um, badass. Um, in fact, this was <laughs> my schedule at one point in my life for about a year and a half. Let's see, Monday through Friday was my shift at Earthlink and it was anywhere between 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock to 8 p.m. Fridays, I would leave a little bit early so that I could go to the gym and then go to the do the Queen Mary show, which was Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night. And once a month, we had to do uh, a full weekend of Soul Train and it was four, we would tape four episodes in one weekend. So it would be a double episode on Saturday and then a double episode on Sunday and immediately following Soul Train while everybody's eating and chill and everything else, I would sneak away so I could do my show at the Queen Mary. Um, however, I never actually could bring my entire me to an audition, a rehearsal, or even a taping. The me's that had to stay home were the nerdy me, the a lot of my friends are white me, the my family is dirt poor me, the I don't know a lot about hip hop me, the I'm not that into sports me, even though I'm a big guy, and the queer me, the big one. Although most of my interactions were cordial, there was a significant amount of homophobia in the Black entertainment, uh, in Black entertainment. Uh, that coupled with just being a bit on the corny side already meant that I had to adapt to my surroundings. Yes, they called me Carlton. Um, so I came up with adaptation method number one, code switching. <laughs> code switching is the use of more than one linguistic variety in a manner consistent with the for, with the syntax of the phonology of each variety. Um, in this case, I would have my Black people, I would try to make sure that I go back home and I use a little more of a typical uh, Black vernacular versus my professional where I could just sort of be myself. Um, and then there were other, my gay, my gay peeps where, uh, where everyone's a she and a her and, and, and we're flipping code switching all over the place. I lost track of who I was. Most people have already mastered the art of a slight behavioral modification, depending on their social surroundings as a psychological tactic to increase their sense of belonging. So most people have their professional personas and their at home personas. So code switching looks more, you know, like this. Um, however, in my case, it was the opposite. I needed to show a completely different side of my personality, of myself, to be relatable, albeit believable. So I tried my best to come across like this without coming across like this. Eventually, I took an indefinite hiatus from show business altogether to gain focus and further pursue my career in um, tech. That was my official statement, at least, that I released. But between you and me, um, I was tired of being in the background uh, and uh, supporting my friends' careers, mostly, um, or winding up on the cutting room floor, because at the time I was doing a lot of un unrepresented stuff. Um, and Or there was the last thing, was mostly constantly needing time off to go to auditions and getting not even getting cast. My agent would send me out two to three times a week. But at that time, no one could in that industry could knew how to market me uh, or someone like me, you know, uh, black, but not black enough. Uh, uh, could totally pass for white, but he's black. And we don't really have a role for him in this particular thing. We don't really know, like, he's a little tall to be the backup dancer, this particular artist a little short, any excuse. Um, except for my agent, of course, who had vision and was pretty awesome. Um, but even today, a majority of the powerful people behind the scenes in television movies look like this. They just don't, inter they don't have a huge interaction with people that look like me. So as a non-mainstream talent, you were expected to stay in your lane and like a Lego piece, you were to go wherever they needed you to fit a demographic. So what on earth does any of this have to do with tech? 
I learned that the tech industry can often be about looking the part in order to thrive. Your brand being young, hip, straight acting, ethnically marketable, articulate, and liberally minded. Kind of like a grinder profile. So as was in entertainment, so was the same in tech. I was passing. Adaptation method number two, passing. Passing is the ability of a person to be regarded as a member of an identity group or category often different from their own, which may include racial identity, ethnicity, caste, social class, social, sexual orientation, gender, religion, age, and or disability status. If you notice the ones in red, those are the things that I was passing. Um, racial identity and ethnicity, I consider that passing when you are able to be, uh, so that when people can look past your race, E easily um, when they interact with you, that's that's a form of passing. Um, social class is in the same regard. Sexual orientation, I come across as being a straight acting male. Um, gender, I'm a guy. I don't know. For some reason, this this it's it's this weird man's world until we fix it, until we change it. And age, I gotta give you guys uh, so, yeah, as as uh, Dana sort of hinted to it. I've been on this planet a lot longer than you think. Passing techniques, resume. Long limit my work history because, as I have said before, I've been on this planet for a long time. Um, my acting dossier, I didn't disclose the one gig that I was most known for. Actually, in the city, people were pretty familiar with me. The club was kind of popular, and people like who'd see me at airports or whatever like that would come by. It's like, hey, I remember seeing you, you know, and they give compliments and that sort of thing, but it was never on my resume. Um, even though I wanted it to be. Uh, code switching, obviously, when I was around um, the, the uh, Black entertainment crew and everyday interactions, I just sort of downplay, except for this particular talk, I very much downplay my age. Like many people, much of my life in both in and out in te of tech was about overcoming assumptions. We are by me, this is me talking, of course, but by no means are we, Black people, the only underrepresented minority in tech we are definitely the most underrepresented minority. <sighs> Another quote, since I'm doing quotes. To be honest, we're doing this more as a social recruitment exercise. I really don't see a college intern adding meaningful value to our team. I mean, maybe if the kid were Asian or something. The VP of a particular company saying this to me. Quick short story. While I was in college, uh, I went out for an interview. I was actually recommended for an, uh, for, uh, an internship. At, uh, I, my undergrad was biomedical engineering. And so the, there was a biotech company in Orange County. And uh, I actually proceeded to take a two hour bus ride to get from uh, downtown Los Angeles to Orange County um, for this interview, made it, um, and kind of had like stopped in my tracks while everyone in the in the office was pretty nice it seemed like the person i was interviewing with just was sort of like it gave me that look of what are you doing here who are you again um and and during the course of being completely candid with me as if like i am like you know miss cleo or something he dropped that little bit of amazing quote um which of course triggered me to be a little more of an angry and when you go into angry mode and in, 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 in an interview as you probably have yourself you start answering very short, very precisely, uh, and uh, and I am actually ended up getting the internship, which I turned down. Um, the second time I experienced this sort of strange bias that people are just so willing to just reveal to you was at a client kickoff while I was at Carbon 5. Um, this is a twofer. Uh, one for me, when I walked into the room, um, uh, when the receptionist brought me into the room, all the chairs were already full and I was the only pepper flake in a bowl of salt. Um, and everyone's eyes, when they looked at me coming in, had the universal <laughs> question that every person of color is, 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 has, has heard all their lives. And it's, um, I think it goes along the lines of, can I help you with something? Uh, so after a while, I sort of, you know, blended in and I guess they got used to my presence and, and I could make a contribution. But I did notice that there was a designer there and um, while she would make suggestions of things at, the, at that time, um, it was very much unheard. Just not, the, the room just didn't respond. It was almost like she did, it's like crickets. She didn't say anything. Um, and we would have another designer, male, and when he would make, uh, and this is something that's, that's common in tech. It seems like if a male designer comes out, he's like Moses with tablets giving you the 10 commandments of design. And these are the UX, these are the UI rules we're going to follow. And we're just 
we're ready to go run with it. Thank you for bringing that. And when a woman does the exact same thing, all of a sudden the floor is up for negotiation and we have to negotiate everything. Um, I called that because I witnessed it firsthand and actually witnessed it over and over, um, brokersion. Having your input not taken seriously by a group, then later repeated by someone else in the group, after which that person who repeated what you said gets credit for your idea, and that idea is met with wild acceptance over and over again. Bias affects who gets heard, period. At meetings and technical decisions, even in open source community and contributions, I've had my share of, of ears raised because I was wondering, like, was I rejected because this person didn't like my contribution or because they didn't trust me? Um, women deal with this all the time. Do they want to just remove their GitHub profile picture and just have like something generic and change their name to something else generic so that people can't, can't have bias and, and, and have extra critique to their, to their contributions? It's something that we struggle with all the time. And we don't know, it's like, is it what we think it is or is it just we're hypersensitive? And usually if you have to ask that question, it is what you think it is. Um, we just really want uh, equality. And to me, equality is the ability to be mediocre and not feel guilty about it, not feel like you're taking up space. Lesson two, always default to compassion. The sorting hat theory of dev teams. It was a lightning talk that I used to do, and it's not a real theory. Basically, uh, there are four tenets to a team. There's discovery. You have that team that's going out there and they're going to find something new. They're going to use new technology. And they're like Prometheus bringing, uh, bringing, bringing fire to the people. And we're going to use this. We're going to, look, oh my gosh, the entire team is converted to React in two months. That is your discovery team. Those, that's Gryffindor. You also have your meritocracy team. These are your brightest, your smartest engineers, and they know it. And they only want to work with the brightest, uh, best engineering talent. Uh, then you have your, and those are your Slytherin. And then you have your Hufflepuffs. Hufflepuffs is, I'm a Hufflepuff myself. We may not be the smartest. We may not be the, you know, whatever, but we're all about the diversity and inclusion and everyone gets a voice. And we always debate things. We try to bring our best selves and we try to bring re respect to, to one another and uh, try to have a good time while we're doing things. Um, and then you have the Ravenclaws. Ravenclaws are to be respected. They're usually the ones that do your backend and your API. Basically, if you're walking around the office, it's the people with the really high cubicles. Uh, they are very talented and very introverted. Cool talk, right? Well, this happened. Yes. So <laughs> never in my years being at uh, Queen Mary would I ever think that I would see the word trans exclusionary radical feminist being printed on the cover of Forbes magazine. I really didn't even understand what was going on at the time. I really didn't. I tried so hard and just I was trying to wrap my head around it. It was it was above it, I was above my pay grade. OK, um, so I because I didn't have a full grasp of the situation, I decided to ask the people who are affected. I think by definition, that's what you call inclusivity having those people available so that you can ask them questions so that you can get clarification before you put your foot in your mouth. I did, and I still didn't have a full concept of a full understanding of the situation. However, I did understand two concepts they mentioned. Microaggression, <laughs> the statement, action, or incident regarding an, uh, an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group. We also call that shade. And plausible deniability. Plausible deniability being the intentional setting up of conditions for the plausible avoidance of responsibility for the consequences of one's actions. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the quintessential Republican Steve Urkel, did I do that uh, way of getting around uh, putting your dog whistle out there to the hateful crowd while not well, about making sure that the people who are affected by your actions, you can cast as being in just being way too sensitive and possibly blowing things out of proportion. So I scrapped the, uh, the talk altogether. I just don't do it anymore. I loved it. It was one of my favorite talks, but I, I don't thinking of the pain it can possibly cause. Always default to compassion. As leaders, we are sometimes faced with a peculiar with peculiar decisions, say like this poor guy 
This is Brian Armstrong, who decided, you know, CEO of Coinbase, um, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, on the tail end of the Floyd situation, to announce that we're going to discourage politics at work. And I'm going to offer a generous severance to the employees who want to quit. It was a kind gesture, working all the angles. And, you know, it could be read multiple ways. I'm sure that Wall Street was like, why are you worrying about what your employees think? And why are you giving them so much money to walk away from you? You're crazy. You're a fool. And then on the opposite side, there are those of us who are like, why would you pick now to do this? I mean, Coinbase, by definition, is politics. I digress. It wasn't until I saw this uh, written uh, piece that he did um, on the blog, and uh, I not normally I'm not I don't pick apart people's things, but it did tick me off. So it starts off with the the typical thing, the corporate mumbo jumbo. I mean, there's a stock price involved, so you gotta you know you gotta at least you gotta wear the tie, right? It's a mission focused company. We gotta play as a championship team, you know. No, yeah, well, I got you there. Okay, we're we're a team. Um, we're company first. Okay, I got you. One Coinbase. One Coinbase is kind of a little bit of all lives matter to me, but I will pass. Act in service of a greater mission. Okay, that mission being possibly something that is a little bit on the shady side, but oh, carry on. And then I saw this, and that's when I flipped the table. Um, yeah, seriously this dude so to people like myself and we probably don't have a lot of voice in this company i don't know if they have the best representation it's not a huge company and there's not exactly like we're just tripping all over black engineers all over the place um he thinks that this is an ideal team this is the dream team well while completely ignoring the fact that we're stepping on people, another team that looks like this. So in essence, his entire blog piece was a very veiled, positively uh, voiced way of saying, shut up and dribble. Um, he needed to ask the people who were affected. I think that's what's meant by inclusivity. Um, what can Brown do for you? He needed to ask himself. Okay, I hear you. I know exactly what you're thinking. Bro, slow the down. Can I just do my job? I'm not an activist. I don't even like politics. Privilege is the ability to refer to a civil discussion as political because you never have to actually experience the consequences. Let that sink in for a moment. Capitalism versus equality versus perception. Today's We Support Black Lives Matter site banners are basically the same as yesterday's pride advertising. When I was young and I would see, and then like early, like 99, 2000, maybe even like as early, uh, whatever, I would look in Out Magazine and I would see these ads from Coors Light and they had the colors and they had, not only was like pride colors, but they had multiple colored gorgeous models right there. And they were drinking that Coors Light. Uh, and it was like, oh my gosh, this company is totally advertising for us. They want our money, they see us. Granted, now uh, on the side, they may have been supporting, you know, Mitch McConnell and a whole bunch of other people who would love to see us sort of rot in a sack. At least on the surface, they were trying to 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 reach out to us, which is the same thing I saw when I would see these open source um, websites, like websites that do open source software and stuff with the huge Black Lives Matter banner and people blacking out their their Instagram pages and corporations. The same thing, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's such an allyship there. But the reality is, allyship comes with risk, right? Don't just be there to get the the brand affinity, um, and in this case with Coinbase. I would recommend, it's not my company, it's not my cat. I would avoid short-term gains, ultimately erring on the side, on the right side of history, because that's always good for business. Anyway, always default to compassion. Okay, <laughs> one other phenomena that happened in 2020, um, because obviously Brian was not alone in a lot of his sentiment and uh, complete being uh, a complete tenure to the climate. Um, Dun, da, 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 tech lead. I think he is probably the nicest person on YouTube that I've ever seen. Um, he does this thing, you know, where he talks, coaches you through some cool stuff that he does. And he tells you, don't do it that way. He's like that TA that you can't stand. Um, and there's something I can't remember. There's something he's totally like 
oh my god there, I, it, it totally escapes me what is he known for what is it that oh that's right he used to work for google um and it's i'm surprised that like i couldn't remember that because it's not exactly he has, he has to say that no less than 50 times per episode uh, okay so anyway he used to work for google uh, wait i mean hashtag used to work for google you wish you were me you need to listen to me hashtag increase that seo hashtag smart and making that dough like and subscribe one of his tweets that got a whopping 93 likes likes on it was exposing black lives matter it's just reverse racism he decides to tweet this thing out basically throwing us under the bus while selflessly promoting his own business i mean you really there's like if you took calculus there's the db and he's definitely the limit as Chloe close to DB without actually hitting it. Um, and so I sat there and watched the 12 minutes of his blah, 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 rambling, rambling, rambling about how, you know, it's just reverse racism and all this other stuff. And I'm just completely about to pop because I, this was the last straw after listening to him complain about being divorced, complain about all these things that are happening and how he doesn't understand and how like, you know, he's basically a, the equivalent of a conehead trying to understand how we exist in this life and why we, why we feel the way we do. Um, I had to come up with a reply, but I wanted to make sure I didn't reply like that typical liberal, not that angry black man. I needed to somehow talk to him in the language he could understand slightly, but still get my point across. So I just said, when you don't understand something, it's far better to ask for help, do some research rather than pontificate ignorance or call it stupid. Spend at least half the time listening as you do talking and you might end up happier. Furthermore, it shows a distinct lack of empathy, something that I've come to notice is a pattern in watching your videos. We could use more leaders in tech. We have enough manners, managers, sorry. Um, but you know what? You probably won't be able to find that video anymore because bah, it's been unlisted. I don't think man even read my response. I don't know if I had anything to do with it. It could have been that a whole bunch of people piled on it and just totally threw him to the dogs. I have no idea, but for whatever reason, maybe he even had a change of heart. But um, I have seen follow-up videos that he's had uh, regarding this. And it does feel as if he has half-heartedly um, think considering that he could his original ideas were wrong. And so I can just say, Thoughts and prayers go out to him on his journey to become a compassionate human being. Privilege is the ability to educate yourself about a problem that you never have to actually experience. So I'm going to sit for a second on this because um, I, it's funny I brought him up and he, was, and he weighed on my mind when I, when, I was, when I started doing this talk because the reality is everyone experiences, is it, has, has experienced some, some problem that has to do with their identity on some form or another. You, there's, there, there's no real avoidance of it. Nobody has the perfect life that, that, that they've never felt insecure about something. But particularly um, in my case, it's even more crucial for you to be an ally if you are already a member of an oppressed or formally oppressed group. Um, when this craziness started and I, and this infuriating craziness started where people were going out and attacking people's parents and grandparents out in the street for being Asian or looking Asian or something. The, the, that, that level of rant, it's something from a movie. And I, and, and I just, I, I, again, I, since I'm not part of that group, I do have an Asian son, but I don't, I can't really speak to that. It's just one of those things where I just, I, 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 where you, all you can do is make sure that you're there. You, you're there when the, when the discussion is had, you contribute to the right causes. You're, you're there um, talking to the people around you who might be incapacitated you sh and you shut it right down right there, but you be that anti-racist, that anti um, uh, 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 violent person in everybody's face. And that's your job. Um, always default to compassion. Lesson three, just because you happen to fall into one of the categories doesn't mean that you always are safe there. Um, mainly, at times, being around Black peers means I had to play downplay the whole gay thing. And at times, being around my LGBTQ peers, um, because we all have a diversity of opinion and a diversity of political opinion at that, I sometimes found myself having to explain the concept of racism to them. Um, 
I thought we were on the same page. I promise this is a last story. I promise it's really short. We, I was invited to work on this project with um, uh, some a team that was in Africa as well as Jamaica. And I was like, for me, it was like, oh my gosh, the dream team. It was like a whole bunch of software engineers that are like African and Jamaican. What the hell? You, this is like, this doesn't happen to me. I'm always that pepper flake. Um, but I did notice that the person who coordinated it would always speak for me. The project manager, the product product slash project manager was, um, would always, I would say something and then she would, per, she would pepper it out to the team and stuff. And, um, and generally on our conference calls, it was sort of like a weird mute thing happening um and finally it sort of dawned on me um i have gay voice uh to put it another way i couldn't pass so uh basically she was speaking for me because these people had their own beliefs and um she was protecting me from whatever backlash be it subtle or be it cold that i would get because whenever i would open my mouth they would think only one thing and they would not really be able to concentrate on the words that I was saying and also to keep me from possibly being picked apart unnecessarily because of their bias. What's really sad about this though, this particular situation is that at the core from my side, this is the intersectionality talk in here, civil rights is the same as pride. It's all, you know, it's all about equality. And just, you know, really kind of getting like weird, I'm not a professor, but if you want to get professorial, have you noticed that the same timeline exists for, for LGBTQ rights as for um, civil rights uh, for us as African-Americans in, in America. Uh, up to the 19th century, we just were trying to fight for the right to exist, you know, to be counted, not to be two thirds of a person, not to be enslaved, not to be broken, our families broken apart, Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th and 14th Amendments and stuff, trying to give, giving us equal protection of the law, we tried. Um, and then eventually having to revisit this again after Jim Crow came in that, you know, and, and, and trying to get in the civil rights law, um, the civil rights bill of 1964, as well as the the um, uh, Voting Rights Act of 65, please. I hope I got these dates right. Um, and then 1967 is significant, I feel, is the equal right to marriage. Because even though you were equal and so people still wanted to keep it separate. And so finally with Loving, Loving versus Virginia, we got that right for equal marriage. And 2010s came back full circle where we finally had the day of reckoning in the media with the way that we are portrayed in the media and our state and who we are, who you know, are we're not, you know, and 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 calling to attention to the to the unfair um, perpetuation of racism that the media has played in, in the fact of how we played in movies and how we're how we're seen on screen. And finally to today the right to privacy and respect, the right to, you know, carry around an Arizona iced tea and Skittles in my own damn neighborhood and not get attacked by a crazy fool, um, the right to fall asleep with my hood boyfriend and not have the police kick the doors in and shoot me, just the right to exist, the right to wear a hoodie, the right to drive a new car without uh, play, without plates, the rights to have a nice car, just trying to get down to, again, the equal protection under the law. Well, it's the same master branch. I mean, main branch. Ha! Huh. Shout out to you guys for doing that. I don't know where the discussion came from. I'm not one of the people that asked for it. And there's still things like master cylinder, slave cylinder stuff that really irk me and stuff. But again, allyship. I really appreciate the people that went through the effort and uh, to, to do this. As well, um, I also think, find it in my own little shot in front of way. Um, it's not the people who go out of their way um, to change it that I that were most impressed me, but it was the people that were very vocal about not liking doing it that I found to be extremely humorous. Anyway, back to the timeline. Um, the same thing happens for LGBT rights. We started in the pre 1980s with Stonewall, um, also the AIDS crisis where we were just considered disposable and um, that we were and this was a, a sin from God and this was your punishment. I'm sorry, this was a sin under God and this was your punishment. To finally in the 90s, um, people have under the, the Clinton administration, um, we had the gay 90s where we were seen as equal and people did, we did start seeing more respect and we were um, trying to, you know, make sure that people weren't not fired because of, because of their sexual orientation. Um, and also that was the beginning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was repealed under the Obama administration because during the Bush administration, it was used to expel 
gays in the military, which I found interesting because most of the people that were there were interpreters that were expelled. And it's kind of weird that you're in the middle of a war and you want to get rid of all the interpreters because, I don't know, they have pride flags. But I digress. Um, don't Ask, No Tell was, uh, was actually the Clinton administration's way of trying to make sure that gays were not excluded from the military and kicked out of the military with dishonorable discharge. And of course, no on hate. Once Obama got into office, we had full throttle um, people saying that no, marriage is only between a biological born man and a biologically born female, whatever the hell that means. They were out there fighting and lying to make sure that people that we could not marry. 2010s came back again. It's a reckoning on Hollywood saying, you know what? I'm tired of every time you see a gay person, it's either Sharon Stone and uh, Basic Instinct. I hope. Or uh, Anthony Perkins and Psycho. And the idea is like, okay, we're diverse. We're not asexual. We should have relationships. We should not be perfect. We, you know, we, you know, start giving us some real, some, some real presence, some three-dimensional presence on screen. And today, good Lord, we just want to go to the bathroom, people. Why is this even an issue? Um, I'm going to tell you something else that's kind of interesting, though. With every single step we make, there is something which which creates us the fight again. So we thought that once we became established citizens and that we were respected, um, that there was that we should have just assumed that we should also be able to take be, be part of the military. But no, they found something to say. You know what? No, 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 no. This is different. This is not for you. We don't want you here. Another form of discrimination. So once we overdid that or, or, or we're talking about that or thinking about overturning it then they came back saying you know what i don't like what you're doing you got to think of you know what this is this is our this is our families we're talking we should not joke about this you should say this is this is marriage is not this is sacred bond you know let me let me talk to my priest like seriously why do, what is what what more do you want from us and then finally they're like would you think of the children what will the children do? They will go. They won't know. Do I need a dress? Do I need pants? They, you know, and so this is where the argument has been. In fact, there's another term I use for this. It's called Newton's third law of motion. Um, basically, for every action in nature, there's an equal and opposite reaction such that the if an object A exerts force on object B, object B is exerting an equal and opposite force in object A. In other words, whenever there's progress, there's backlash. But back to intersection. I got a little quiz for you. Do you know what the one common denominator is between Montgomery bus boycott, sit-in movements, and march on Washington? Tick tock, tick tock. No, I don't have time. I'm going to tell you. They were all organized by this man, Bayard Effin Rustin. He was Martin Luther King's right-hand man and was the champion of nonviolent um, protest. And he was mother effing gay girl. He organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congress for Racial Equality, and forged coalitions with neighboring groups such as the American Jewish Con Conference. Basically, he's like, we're all in this together. We need to start working together. We're all the same people. Um, he's actually was a devoted follower of the Gandhian movement, especially while he was spent when he spent time in India. And he insisted that the groups press forward with the idea of nonviolent civil resistance as a primary means to getting a message out to the complacent and indifferent public, even though the people who were the executives at that time felt that this was a meek, uh, weak way of response to very violent um, uh, racism, especially in the Jim Crow South. You haven't heard of Byron Rustin. For shame, ugh, but it's uh, by design. Um, gay content, gay history is still considered for mature audiences only. Um, the severe lack of African-American, Asian-American and Latin American history is already known in schools. We just neglect to really give people history about these people. And LGBTQ history, on the other hand, is virtually non-existent. However, the mature content label itself is rooted in prejudice and bias. Content firewalls have been, have, by the way, the mature content label even was used back when we talk about racism and stuff when it came to rap albums. 
but I digress. Content firewall providers have been known to block LGBTQ websites, demonetization of LGBTQ related videos on YouTube due to AI, um, librarian bias, even blocked LGBTQ search terms from school computer browsers. It's yet another form of discrimination with the intended purpose of minimizing your knowledge of this by making you fear this. But back to Rustin. A recurring problem in our own community is that successful Black men who happen to be gay or, or, or even appear as gay are not celebrated. Uh, rather, they are seen as part of a bigger problem with society's perception of Black men, the roots of which stem from years of the media's obsession with making sure to only allow for either non-sexual, not sorry, non-threatening, asexual, passive, and subservient stereotypes, the mammy, or uh, Uncle, uh, Uncle Ben, or a violent and over-sexualized stereotype, but always disposable for African-Americans. Many professionals who are out to close friends choose to remain in the closet publicly, both out of fear, as well as out of a sense of responsibility to the black community. For many successful African-American men, being gay is seen in our community as yet another part of the systematic emasculation of black men. And then there's our religious organizations themselves, which historically have been the most impactfully organized groups fighting for Black civil rights, but have only recently come to accept LGBTQ individuals. Almost done. But wait. Lesson four. I'm wrapping it up. Let me take a moment to check my own privilege. Let's stop counting my privileges. This is probably a daily affirmation you should do for yourself every day. Someone called me smart when I was young. I can't see you guys. I can't see your chat. I can't see your comments because I'm presenting. But in your head, raise your hand if someone at some point in your life called you smart and you remember when that happened. It's a very empowering feeling. It changes everything and it sets you up on a course of success. My mother read to me another thing. It is, I, I, I'm surprised, maybe it's just because I don't read a lot. Um, that is not something that we make as a requirement in elementary school that you read to your kids. Because what happens is you read to your child and then one day with, without any uh, provocation, they grab the book from you, they turn it around and they wanna read to you. And then later on, you have the school telling you, oh my gosh, he or she reads so well and blah, blah. And, 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 and it's just that that child has already gotten that affirmation of being smart and worth something and can do something. And, and, and understand that is the one thing that gets you and sets you apart from your surroundings is your own uh, feeling of self-determination. I went to a preschool too, y'all. Preschools are the bomb. I also went to a magnet school. You can't beat a magnet school. When you got a whole bunch of people trapped in, in a brick building, uh, focused, uh, hyper-focused uh, on something, whether it be arts, whether it be just being geeking out, whether it be medical, whatever it is, that, that is the one thing that helps you focus and, 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 and set you up on an, another path to success. Um, someone valued my demographic. Um, I don't call it tokenism. There have been times when people were just interested in just bringing me in for who I was. But the main thing is I'm no one's uh, uh, bro. Uh, what's it? Uh, I'm no one's. I can't think of it. I'm no one's token. Uh, I try to make sure that I bring what I uh, the talent to the table to the table and rise to the occasion. But I do think the fact that someone has the forethought to even think that I'm worthy of something that they want that they want to have represented because there are a lot of people out there who may not who may not have that one little extra thing that you know you walk into an interview and they're expecting you not to do so well and then you just be yourself and all of a sudden they're like holy crap i've never met someone like you it's it's a weird thing it's when you're a unicorn take pride in your unicornness and um and be thankful um people fought hard battles before me for my benefit goes without um any explanation. And where I live, y'all, I live in California. There's a lot of problems that we have here, but there's a lot of problems we do not have here. And I feel that the fact that I'm able to be who I am and, and just be the best me that I know how to be has to do with the fact that everyone here is really just on their phones driving and doesn't give a damn what I am doing at any moment in time. And I really appreciate that. I want to take a moment, though, to point out the great work that my teammates have been doing at Carbon5 um, to further discussion and teach DEIB practices. 
There's a blog uh, post in particular called Intersectionality in Tech. I know, weird coincidence, right? Um, this is a long URL, so I'm just going to chuck it up to blog.carbon5.com. And uh, you can find it there. And these people did research and they've got numbers and they got advice. And it's not just coming up from the top of their head and from the other part of their body. Um, it's a four part series specifically about how you can create products that are that ask those questions early during every part of the cycle from the uh, ideation to design to development. Um, a, a, how you can be more inclusive and 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 in your in your in your products and stuff. What what questions to ask when? It was put together by a genius friend of mine, Nicole Thayer. She's a principal designer over at Carbon Five, and another friend of mine, Tiffany Wong, senior software engineer, formerly at Carbon Five, but she works for Car for Coinbase now. And for that girl is dead to me now. Just kidding. Um, uh, come check this blog out in particular. In fact, just check all of our blogs out. Just do, if you have some time, spare time. I know you, I'm, I'm reading up on your blogs and stuff too. I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of a little addicted to it. It's kind of interesting. I, I even have a Medium subscription. It's like, like I have time to just read all this stuff that people have to write, but it's sometimes interesting. Um, again, as uh, Dana said, we are Carbon 5 and we are, do, in addition to product development, we um, also do team building uh, and team development stuff. Um, um, and uh, I just got to say, we have the ability to influence change. We need to bring our whole selves. We need to speak up for others because the buck really stops with us, all of us.